Welcome to the muscle chapter. This chapter has quite a few sections. There are actually 24 different sections or concepts. And so since this is all going to be one video, you're definitely going to have to stop and replay and replay over and over and over because there's just so much stuff to comprehend and to absorb. So I suggest stopping and, you know, so for the first segment, I suggest studying sections one, two, three, four, five, and six together, stopping at development. And then for the second piece, study seven, eight, and nine, actin and myosin, the sliding filament theory and action potential cycle. And then for the third section, study uh, beginning the contraction cycle, the actual contraction cycle, and then how to end the contraction cycle. The fourth section, I would do muscle tension, the twitch, and muscle recruitment. And then finally, for the last section, I would do together uh, muscle optimization. How do I get ripped? What about the, the different kinds of muscle fibers? And then the energy systems. Actually, sorry. That's the second to the last section. And then finally, uh, the different kinds of fuels, the types of contractions, the essentials of fitness, the Cori cycle, and then uh, DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. <laughs> so um, there are quite a few different things. Don't Please don't expect to be able to run through this one time and have everything. This is uh, a condensed version of uh, three or four lectures compressed into one. So you're 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 gonna definitely need to stop this and replay this over and over and over uh, to to gain everything that that I want you to gain. <laughs> so to begin, uh, the characteristics of muscle tissue, we have four different terms that. I want you to be familiar with. Muscle is excitable. It's contractile. It has extensibility and elasticity. So just know these terms and know what they mean. Excitability means that it has the ability to respond to stimuli um, because it's innervated by a nerve. It has the ability, it, it's, it has contractility, which is the ability to shorten and thicken. How does the muscle do what it does? How does it pull on bone, for example? Well, it, it's, it shortens to, you know, and you get that sort of belly in the middle. That's called contractility. Well, extensibility is the ability to stretch without being damaged. <coughs> so it's sort of the opposite of contractility, to contract and to extend, to contract and to extend. Contractility is shortening, Extensibility is elongating or stretching without damage. Lots of cells in our body, most cells in our body, aren't able to do that. They don't stretch, they don't shorten, they don't elongate. Um, and if they did, they would be damaged, they would be ripped. Muscle is, is different in that way. And finally, elasticity is the ability to go back to the original length uh, whether it was whether the the muscle is contracted or extended it can go back to the original length that's called elasticity okay <coughs> and um, a note to know is muscle cells in particular have re require are, are, are high maintenance it takes a lot to maintain a muscle cell, which means it takes a lot of energy to keep it alive. It requires a lot of calories to keep that muscle cell alive, relatively speaking, compared to, for example, 
fat cells. Fat cells take a l very little energy to keep those alive uh, because there are a lot less parts, a lot less moving parts. Muscle cells have lots and lots of moving parts and it takes a lot to keep those uh, different uh, constituents working and uh, functional. So muscle cell is uh, highly metabolic. Uh, we have three different kinds of muscle. We're going to focus on skeletal muscle and skeletal muscle um, when they contract they can pull on bone they have different uh, functions uh, but let's go through just the other two um, um, since we're talking about the, the tissue at the tissue level um, we'll just briefly briefly hit cardiac and smooth cardiac muscle contracts when it contracts it propels blood through the heart and actually through um, helps through the the whole body as well um, since the the cardiac muscle is is the heart muscle and uh, and then we have smooth muscle tissue and these contractions um, move fluids and solids through um, through the body for example the GI tract um, the esophagus um, in your uh, in your lungs any anything uh, our arteries our veins anything that um, basically all other muscle that's not skeletal muscle is uh, smooth muscle all the all the muscle around our viscera that's all smooth muscle okay now skeletal muscle in particular moves bones that's the big one is bones your elbow your knees your hips your shoulders those those joints move by skeletal muscle that's why it's called skeletal muscle because that muscle attaches to skeleton the eyes the muscles of the eyes those 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 five six muscles in the eyes um are are skeletal muscle they they uh they are not autonomic but they are um we communicate by the frontal cortex um, we have to think it and our eyes move unlike the heart for example where um, we don't have to think beat 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 our heart beats autonomically automatically uh, the skin of the face the muscles of 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 the face uh, those are all skeletal muscle um, um, it moves air. Skeletal muscle moves air in our lungs. Also, it the also we can move food through the mouth and uh, the throat, the top half of the esophagus. That's skeletal muscle. Um, and and when we walk when we stand up when we contract for example our our lower leg muscles or upper leg muscles like our gastrocnemius or soleus when we do this the muscles f shorten fatten and squeeze the blood vessels allowing uh, uh, propelling helping blood to uh, move back up all the way up to the heart And um, and and we also have um, um, uh, moving urine out of the bladder using the first external sphincter, and feces out of the rectum using the first ex external sphincter as well. Uh, we, then we have cardiac muscle, and finally smooth muscle, the the rectus pili. Our, our hairs, our, our, our muscle that are attached to the hairs. When they, when they shorten, they make the hair erect or so they stand upright. And you also get a little goosebump because the, the muscle itself makes a little belly. 
and therefore you get this little bump on the hair uh, under on, on the skin and there's your there's your goose bump and that's called the that muscle is called the erector erector pili sperm move through the vas deferens through smooth muscle um, the fetus out of the year the uh, pushing the fetus out of the uterus uh, during labor those contractions are smooth muscle contractions um, gland secretions are by smooth muscle also urine from the ureters it's not it's not by gravity when 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 we urinate when we pee the uh, the urine doesn't move out by uh, out of the out of the ureters um, by gravity that's actually done by smooth muscle we could be standing up we could be upside down uh, doesn't really have anything to do with gravity um, and then out of the urinary bladder also smooth muscle not not skeletal muscle food from the bottom half of the esophagus to the anus that's all smooth muscle all that GI tract and also feces um, out of the out of the rectum using the first internal sphincter um, okay also in skeletal muscle not only does skeletal muscle can uh, move joints but also uh, you know for locomotion but also maintenance maintenance of posture us uh, allowing us to stand upright or sit upright or sit or stand in a particular uh, uh, position that's maintenance of posture and maybe the most important out of all these that we tend to forget a major function of skeletal muscle is maintenance of body temperature we our temperature is at what it's at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit because of none other than skeletal muscle we we always think oh yes yeah, skeletal muscle it's it's um, it allows us to move around the, the world to walk to jump to sit yes but another huge function of skeletal muscle is maintaining body temperature is, is is keeping us at 98.6 why do we get hot when we exercise well because we're exercising well yeah well it's the skeletal muscle that's working extra hard to to do what we're demanding of it and therefore it generates this quote unquote waste but it's not it ends up not being waste it actually um, keeps us um, at our body temperature and exceeds and therefore we get hot why do we need a blanket at night well because we are not using our skeletal muscle anymore and therefore the body cools and actually the body prefers to be a couple degrees below 98.6 um, during during the night hours during sleeping hours uh, so we, we put a blanket on because now we're not using our skeletal muscle and therefore the body cools down and, and, and there you have it. There's a couple a couple of things to know about uh, at, you know at the gross level, um, the heads, the heads at the ends of the muscles, we can have one or two or three or four heads at the ends and also the middle part of the, of the skeletal muscle is called the belly. That's the widest part. Now, how do we attach the muscle to to the uh, to the bone? Muscle cells actually don't touch the bone at all. The cells themselves, the muscle cells themselves, don't actually touch. It's the connective tissue that surrounds and that's interwoven throughout throughout the muscle. Actually, en ends up interweaving in the periosteum of the bone. The collagen, specifically the collagen fibers, makes up that CT, and that connective tissue ends up we interweaving in the periosteum, and that's how you have that strength. That's how it's it's extremely um, strong, and can and if the muscle is strong enough, can actually snap the bone, stronger than bone even. 
So, uh, and we'll see, we'll, we'll look at this, this uh, connective tissue in just a second. We'll see how we have various layers throughout the muscle cell of that connective tissue. And aponeurosis is um, a, a broad sheet connecting muscle to muscle or muscle to bone. And if we look here at the um, external oblique aponeurosis, if you see that on the left-hand side there, external oblique, um, we, have, we have the external oblique muscle on the right side and the external oblique muscle on the left side and they're connected to each other by this connective tissue that's attached to the muscle and then they attach to themselves so instead of them attaching in the center of the belly to bone it's attached to the just to itself to the connective tissue called a an aponeurosis well we have different types of fascia we have superficial fascia and we have deep fascia superficial fascia in deep fascia. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll skip here to slide 18 and we'll take a look at this. It's important for you to to know the to know these terms, the different levels of organization and to know uh, their order. So if we start if we start at the at the at the largest, level of organization at the biggest level we have what we call it what we call a muscle group muscle group we say muscle 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 all the time so we have to use different terms to know specifically what exactly we're, we're talking about uh, so the largest group if you if you take your hand and you um, wrap your hand around your biceps for example that's the muscle group that we're talking about, like the biceps brachii, for example. Or here, uh, this might be the quadriceps, uh, um, the, vastus, er, the vastus medialis, for example. Um, so that's the muscle group. It is definitely visible to the naked eye. It's, it's um, surrounded by the first... Um, wrapping, which is called the epimysium. The epimysium is superficial fascia. The next group, um, the next group in now, the next level of organization after muscle group is called a fascicle. If you look inside of a muscle group, you see, if you kind of count there, it looks like we have I want to say in this particular diagram, you know, maybe 20 or so, 20 or so fascicles. So you see the fascicles inside of the muscle group. Now that number of course varies, there's not always going to be 20, but the point is, is that you can also see the fascicle, those fascicles with the naked eye. You don't need a microscope to see fascicles. If you take a piece of meat, um, you're, you're cooking a, a piece of beef, you get a big uh, block of beef and you start cleaning it and separating the parts of, uh, and you can, you know, and they're separated by the by connective tissue, you're most likely separating the different fascicles. Those are fascicles. So in this diagram there's, there's a roughly 20. And you see that fascicle sticking out now out of the muscle group. So fascicle is the next level of organization. What is a fascicle wrapped by? What type of connective tissue? This is now called the perimysium. The muscle group is wrapped, what's wrapping around the muscle group? What, what type of connective tissue? It's called epimysium. And paramysium wraps around each and individual fascicle. Epimysium is superficial fascia. Paramysium is deep fascia. And all other connective tissue that's wrapping around smaller and smaller units, that's all called deep fascia. The only superficial fascia
that exists is just the epimycium, just the first one, superficial, and all the rest are called deep, 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 deep. If you want to be more specific, then we can say, oh, epimycium, paramycium, and the third level of organization is called a muscle fiber. So let's go back to fascicle. We look at the fascicle, and we can see, I want to say, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, let's call it 20. I can see roughly 20 muscle fibers in that one fascicle. 20 muscle fibers in one fascicle. And that's this is just a diet, this is just a cartoon. Uh, there could there can be a hundred or two hundred or three hundred or four hundred um, muscle fibers in a single fascicle. So I, I so let's go back to the very beginning. We have a muscle group and and what what we see the next level inside of that muscle group are called fascicles. You look at a fascicle, a cross section of a fascicle, and we have a whole bunch of muscle fibers. Now, what is a muscle fiber? A muscle fiber is actually the muscle cell. It's actually a muscle cell. Why do we call it a fiber? Well, because they're they're really really long. They're they're long like fibers. Muscle fiber and muscle cell is the same thing. What is the muscle fiber? wrapped by what type of connective tissue? It's wrapped by endomycium. So we have muscle group wrapped by epimycium, or we can say superficial fascia. We have a fascicle that's wrapped by paramycium, or we say, or we can say deep fascia. And we have a muscle fiber that's wrapped by endomycium, and that's also called deep fascia. All right, so now we're at the third level of organization. The fourth level of organization is called myofibrils. There are several myofibrils inside of a single muscle fiber. If we pull one of those out, we can see... Um, going perpendicular that they there's light and dark bands light and dark light and dark light and dark now myofibrils are the the next level of organization be careful because we have fiber and we have fibril and there's actually one more level of organization and those are the myofilaments so we have fiber, fibril, and filaments, okay? And so if we take a look at the how those are um, different from each other, if, I, if we f fast forward just a little bit, we'll go back, but I just wanted to show you here. Um, here is slide 52. Do you see? Do you see this this um, long this long uh, structure at, up at the top with the red and the blue? This one structure is called a fibril. This is one single fibril. And inside of it, we have several filaments. We have several filaments. There's two different kinds of filaments. There is thin and there is thick. We have actin and we have myosin. The thin filaments are, called, are the blue ones, and the thick filaments are the red ones. So there are several myofilaments in a single myofibril. I'll say it again. There are several myofilaments in a single myofibril. 
So if you look at the cross section of a fibril, we see there, that there's a bunch of red dots and a bunch of blue dots. Those are the, the filaments. There are two different kinds of filaments, thick and thin. So there are several filaments in a fibril. There are several fibrils. There are several fibrils in a muscle fiber. There are several fibers in a fascicle, and there are several fascicles in a muscle group. So that's going to take, uh, you know, a few minutes. Don't expect to have it all down in, you know, and just move on. I want you to pause this and, uh, and, and, and make sure to get the order down correctly and um, to be able to see, to be able to recognize this on a, on a diagram and say, oh, well, if you give me one level of organization, I can give, I can give you the rest. Or if I see the bone, like in this, in this picture here, I can tell you what's, what exactly is what without, um, without seeing the actual terminology. Um, here, how far down can we see? We have the muscle group, we have the fascicles. There's, let's see here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's like, I can see seven fascicles in the muscle group. And then let's see, how many fibers are we looking at? You know, 10 or 15 fibers there, muscle cells inside of each fascicle. That's as far down as we can see in this particular diagram. What are the last few? After the fiber, we have fibrils, and after the fibrils, inside of each fibril, we have filaments, and those are the those two different kinds of filaments are again the actin and the myosin. So make sure to have make sure to have those five levels of organization down. Make sure you have the order down. Make sure to know what wraps around each of them. Is it uh, superficial or is it deep fascia? Is it epimyceum? Is it paramyceum? Is it endomyceum? And, uh, and have that, those orders down as well. All right. Um, now on slide uh, 27 here, we have different, um, we have different shapes of skeletal muscle. We have fusiform, we have parallel, we have convergent, we have different types of pennant, like feathers, pennant like feathers, unipennant, bipennant, multipennant, pennant, and we have circular. And and really the, the largest thing is just understanding what you know what they look like. So the fusiform starts thin and then it, you get this belly and then and then thin again. For example, and this this you find uh, in for example the biceps brachii. At the two ends there's there there are these skinny points and in the middle you get this belly. Parallel parallel like the like your six pack or your eight pack in your abdomen like the for example the rectus abdominis those are par those are parallel type muscles where the fibers run more or less parallel to each other. You have convergent, like the pectoralis major, that, that big chest, those two big chest muscles allow you to do push-ups. Uh, the pectoralis major is a convergent where the, the, the muscles at the sternum have a very uh, broad attachment However, as they move, as those muscle cells move laterally um, and away from the midline, they converge into a single point, which is why it's that type of muscle shape is called a convergent muscle. We also have unipennant, 
bi pennant and multi pennant. Careful, because the multi pennant kind of looks like convergent, but you see like the little how the fibers are 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 sort of oblique. They're kind of running at an angle, and that's what makes those feather looking uh, muscles. And then finally, the circular like the um, uh, like the orbicularis oculi, the orbicularis oris, the the sphincters that are, that run circular. Those are the circular muscles. The strongest of these, the most powerful of these muscles, uh, tend to be the pennants because they're the fibers are very very short. They run short, so they tend to be very powerful. The convergent muscle is, it's, it, at the cellular level, it's not very powerful, but it's also but it is very um. What's the word? Um, I'm trying to think of the word. Um, it can do the most. It, it can do the, the the most functions. You can you can do. You know, it helps you do um, pull ups, push ups. Uh, it's very. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the word. Um, vers versatile. That's the word I'm thinking of. It's very versatile, because it has a very broad attachment. So it can, it can. Um, it can help you with uh, dips, for example, when you're doing dips on a on a bar at the gym, um, which is this, you know, motion when your when your body is perpendicular to the ground. You can do push-ups when your body is parallel to the ground, and you can do like handstands um, using that same muscle. Um, uh, obviously, along with other muscles, but handstands using that same muscle. So your your arm can go from all the way up above your head to all the way down at the side of your body using that convergent because it has so many attach you know very very broad attach attachment at the sternum there. Okay. All right. We have muscle roles. We got prime mover, synergists, and antagonists. And these muscles change roles depending on what exercise you're doing. If you're doing, for example, um, a, a curl, um, um, you know, dumbbell curls, for example. If you're doing dumbbell cur curls at the gym, for example, and you have a, you know, you got your bar and you throw on a couple of um, 10 pounds on each side. When you, when you, as you, if you start down at the bottom, fully extended, and you slowly bend your elbow, bend, 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 bend your elbow till it's up, till the bar is up by your neck. You have some muscles. You have a muscle that's a prime mover, one or several muscles um, that are synergists, and you have muscles that are antagonists. So curling or flexing the elbow, contract flexing the elbow, the prime mover in this case, the main one, the main muscle that allows you to do this would be for this would be this in this example would be the biceps brachii. That that and very anterior muscle on your on your upper arm. And and that's that's in the in front, the anterior one. That's your biceps brachii. But you also have some muscles that help this action. And that would one of those, for example, would be your um your brachialis. Your brachialis also helps you flex your elbow, but it's just not the prime mover. And that's not the main one that's working in this particular case, in this particular exercise. The antagonist muscle or muscles are the ones that would relax during that exact exercise but would work to extend the elbow. If you're flexing the elbow, the antagonist would relax and the prime mover would work. And if you do the opposite exercise, 
the antagonist then becomes the prime mover, and the prime mover would then become the antagonist. So if you're flexing the elbow, if you're doing this curl going up, 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 the antagonist in this example would be the uh, triceps brachii. But let's say, for example, we want to do um, elbow extensions. We want to do um, uh, tricep extensions. You lay on your back, you reach for a weight that's above your head, and you move your elbow from being fully uh, flexed to fully extended. Now, what muscle is primarily working? Now, it's the triceps brachii. That's the prime mover. And in this case, the antagonist doing these extensions, these tricep extensions, the, the, the antagonist now would be the biceps brachii because the biceps brachii wouldn't be working at all. It would be fully relaxed because you don't need it to do these extensions. You don't need it to pick things up when you're laying on your back and picking something up that's uh, on top of your head or next to your head. So the prime mover and the antagonist muscle the, the, or the muscle changes roles depending on what um, exercise you're doing. And we have some examples here for you. So here's your biceps brachii in the, in the you know, anterior. You have your brachialis that's, that's close to it, that's in front of your humerus, anterior to your humerus. But it's just not the prime mover. It's a, it helps. It does help with flexing the elbow if you're doing a curl. And then the triceps brachii would be behind or posterior to the humerus. And, um, and that's why it's on the other side of the bone. And that's why those two muscles are always going to be the opposite of each other. I mean, different roles. And that, ten and that tends to always be the case. One muscle on one side of the bone, one muscle on the other side of the bone. And trainers will often tell you, you know, you, 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 uh, if you, you know, you, some people want go to the gym, they, they really, they want to get uh, a six pack or, you know, working out their abs, 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 abs. Well, you got to work out the muscles on the other side of your back just as much as the muscles on the front side. Um, to keep yourself healthy. The next um, section tends to be quite confusing, and uh, so uh, uh, we'll take it sort of easy and run through this. Just don't spend too much time. Just I'm just trying to save your time here. Um, just sort of get your feet wet, kind of be familiar, but you don't have to go crazy on this section. I'd rather you learn many, many other sections before this one. Um, but since it lands right here, we'll talk about the first class muscles, second class muscles, and the third class muscles. So depending on where... Um, so you always have three parts um, to the joint. You have the fulcrum, which is where the hinge is, you have the resistance, and you have um, the the applied force, and the applied force is what uh, is the direction that the muscle is going to pull. In the first class um, here, the fulcrum is in the middle, and both the resistance and the applied force are in the downward position. So if you relax your neck muscles, gravity will pull your nose down. When you apply the force, your neck muscles, for example, your trapezius, for example, your 
um, your head will pivot and um, and um, bring your head from a flexion position and your head will will extend will you'll, you'll begin to look up straight up again in second class now instead of the fulcrum being in the middle the fulcrum is at one end and the resistance is now in the middle so if you look at the gastrocnemius for example uh, your ankle is now um, doing the the resistance here gravity is pulling down on your ankle and but but what pivots is um, uh, the fulcrum way 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 out and then your when you when you when you when you pull your calf when you flex your calf muscle you end up standing on your tippy toes uh, because the fulcrum is now way out at the end very powerful uh, muscle and the third class is where your applied force is actually in the middle, not the fulcrum, not the resistance, but the applied force is in the middle. The fulcrum is way out at the end, um, and the resistance is at the other end. You put uh, you put a, a book, for example, in your hand. You're going to have resistance. The gravity will pull, try to pull the the book down. The applied force now is in the middle. Your biceps brachii will pull, and you your your pivot then will be on the outside, and uh, where your elbow is, pulling your arm towards your shoulder, flexing your elbow there. So those are the three classes: first, third, first, second, and third class of uh, of joints. Okay, we have uh, we have a little bit of. Um, muscle development. Muscles will will differentiate uh, into myoblasts and they begin to fuse together. When they fuse together each each of these have a nuclei. When they fuse together you have this multinucleate immature muscle. What does that mean? It, it, it means that the muscle now um, is is looking closer and closer like our typical muscle, but it just it's missing those contractile fibers. So when you have those myoblasts and they fuse together, now you have a, a one single cell, but it just has a whole bunch of nuclei because they've all those single cells have fused together. But it's just it's still useless. So it's this immature muscle fiber. It's it's useless. It's just basically a you know a worm that's a useless worm. And as it develops and develops, it'll develop these uh, actin and myosin, and eventually you'll have these this zebra print uh, called striations. And those striations run perpendicular to the length of the muscle fiber. Those, that zebra print that you see there, dark white, dark light, dark light, dark light, and now you have yourself um, a mature muscle fiber, an adult muscle fiber. And then those little bumps at the outside, so you have nuclei, but you also have these, um, these satellite cells. Every once in a while you have these one of these satellite cells uh, spread around the muscle fiber, and those uh, repair any and can actually differentiate into um, uh, cells and re repair the repair the fiber as needed and of course these are limited these are limited s satellite cells so eventually they we run out and um, and once we run out then our muscles can no longer repair which is why we which is uh, uh, which um, contributes to aging. Here's another diagram here. We have uh, dividing myoblasts. They align, they fuse. You got your immature muscle fiber there during cell fusion there, and then you have your mature muscle fiber where you have the uh, contractile filaments all ready to go and, and your muscles able to actually 
contract. Okay, now, now we're gonna start. Um, now we're gonna start talking about all the anatomy at at the uh, at the cellular level. All the little organelles, all the little pieces of the of the muscle cell. Um, so we have thousands of myofibrils that run the length of the fiber. In in those initial diagrams that we saw, you know, we're not gonna we're we're not gonna no one's gonna draw out thousands of myofibril myofibrils. Um, uh, that would just take too long, it, and it kind of defeats the the purpose of the of the lesson. We're just showing you a couple of them, so that you can sort of see how how they're lined up and how they interact with each other. And uh, but in reality, there's actually thousands per muscle cell. And of course, inside of the myofibril, what do we have? We have a whole bunch of myofilaments. How many, how many different kinds of myofilaments do we have? Two. Two different kinds of myofilaments. What are they called? Myosin and actin. Actin and myosin, the thin and the thick. Okay. <clears throat> Let's uh, take a deep breath here. Hold your breath. Because <laughs> there, there's a lot of stuff here now. So you, you got you to gotta focus here. Um, uh, you, can, you can get lost very easily here. So uh, the thin filament now, the actin now, we'll start with actin. Actin has, has two F-actin molecules. What does F stand for? It, it stands for filament. There are two of them in a single filament. There are two F-actin molecules in a single filament. So, if you look at that uh, Twizzler-looking thing on the left-hand side, the Twizzler that's that's um, twisted over and over and over, twirled, those those are the two F-actin molecules that we're talking about. If you if you go to the right and you zoom in, you see there's a whole bunch of more stuff when you zoom in. But but. And, and each of those things have different things. But in general, when you smash them all together, we, we just call them, okay, we, get, we call them 2-F-actin filaments. 2-F filaments. Here again, we see, okay, I, it looks like we have, on the top there, we have the tropidin complex. We have tropomyosin, which looks like another Twizzler, around a Twizzler, and we have G-actin. Well, if you smash all those together, the the broad picture there's actually only two F actin filaments, and those F actin filaments are made up of. If you look at one of those F actin filaments, it's made out of a bunch of G actin, and does and a, in a Twizzler of tropomyosin and troponin complex. So one F actin filament is made up of a bunch of G actin molecules. What does G stand for? It stands for globs, globulins, globs, which are like little balls. So one F actin is made up of a whole bunch of G actin. How many? Like roughly a, a, a length is roughly makes up um, is made up of roughly 400 of these globs. Um, we have a nebulin through the center. And let's see, yes, do you see in the top right figure that that bar that goes through the center of that entire thing? There is a nebulin in the middle there. If you look at this one, it's missing nebulin. It's missing it here, but here on the right side, we actually see it, nebulin. Uh, and that goes through the center of the 2F actin. We also have tropomyosin. And that's another double-stranded molecule, and that covers those globs, the G-actin's active sites. OK, 
careful now because we have tropomyosin and we have troponin or the troponin complex. You can say troponin or the troponin complex. It might make more sense to say troponin complex because there's actually three proteins, not just one. So you got to keep straight the difference between tropomyosin and troponin. Tropomyosin is another Twizzler looking strand, whereas the tro whereas troponin are just three proteins that are bound to each other, and each of those uh, proteins have a specific function. We'll see in just a second. All right, so actin is made up of two F actin. Each of those F actin is made up of a bunch of G actin and troponin and tropomyosin. So far, so good. What is the function of tropomyosin? Just very briefly, we're going to we're going to actually dig into it, but very briefly, that uh, that pink looking strand that's uh, those that's uh, that that looks like a Twizzler is covering up active sites that are existing on the purple balls on G actin. You can't see the active sites because the because tropomycin is covering it up. If you want to actually see here on the top those active sites, you can kind of see it behind tropomycin. If you look at the bottom figure here, now tropomyosin has rolled off of the off of the active sites, or you can say myosin binding sites. That's the same thing. Actin's active sites is the exact same thing as myosin binding sites. And when tropomyosin rolls off of the active sites, now they're exposed. Now you can see them. So you see the difference between the bottom figure and the top figure. And finally, the last piece is troponin, the troponin complex. We have three binding globs that are dispersed around the outside. Each has a particular job. One, we don't have to know. We don't have to know which one is which. However, you do have to know that one of them locks that Twizzler strand together, locks the locks tropomyosin, tropomyosin together. So you see the pink. There's two strands of tropomyosin spun together. One of those troponin globs keeps that that pink strand together. Another another section of troponin locks to G actin. So another one locks itself to the purple. And finally, the third one has a couple of little active sites, binding sites, that can accept two calcium ions. I don't really see it. I don't really see any of those having uh, calcium, uh, having a little active site, a little binding site. However, if you look in this diagram, troponin is now purple. You see the three purple globs. I now do see on one of those purple globs, I do see like little green binding sites, and that that one must be the glob that accepts two calcium ions. And if you, if you look down at the bottom diagram, there it is. Two calciums have bonded to, uh, tr to troponin. All right, there's a lot of stuff there. I mean, we got F-actin, we got G-actin, we got nebulin, we have troponin, we have tropomyosin, we got different parts of, the, of troponin. And there's a lot of stuff to keep track of. Do I have to know all of these parts? The answer is yes. Do I have to know the function of all of these different parts of actin? The answer is yes. The good news is that the second myofilament, 
the thick one is actually a lot less complicated. There's not there there aren't all these moving parts. There's there are moving parts, but just a lot less. All right, the thick filament, myosin. One myosin molecule is is uh, is has uh, 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 the thick filament consists of roughly three hundred myosin molecules, and one has one bound tail and two free heads. One tail and two heads. Each of those has one tail and two heads. You wrap them all up together and you got yourself a thick filament. You got yourself myosin. Each thick filament has a core of titan. Titan. Some of the titan is exposed and attaches to the z-line. It's an elastic coil Titan. Titan is an elastic coil. That it's a spring, like a spring. Instead of compressing, though, it's when it stretches. It's an elastic coil that signals the muscle to stop stretching. When it unwinds, unwinds, and strip to the point that it's totally taut and stretched, it signals the muscle to stop so that the muscle can relax and recoil. You've gone too far, you've gone too far, you've stretched enough. That's the job of Titan. Let's take a look. So inside of this thing, we have Titan. Let's see if we can see it. Titan is green. You see that there? Titan is, in, is, is found inside of the thick filament, and the other end is bound to the Z-line. So, if you look up at the top figure, do you see the uh, do you see the zigzag going back and forth? That's the Z line, and the other side is the Z line. And if we go forward another one, again we have the Z line, or here it's called the Z disc. Same thing. And in the middle figure there, I see a little bit of Titan, that little coil-looking thing. That little spring-looking thing is is Titan. When when the Z lines pull apart from each other, and the muscle stretches, 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 those those uh, coils um, will stretch, 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 and once they're completely taut, stretched out. To, um, Titan will, will, will signals the muscle to stop and so that we can feel okay it's it's we, we shouldn't go any further okay um, all right thick filament so now we're approaching the sliding filament theory. When a skeletal muscle fiber contracts, when it shortens, okay, the energized cocked myosin head, it binds to the other filament, to actin. And then they release their energy, and then they pivot, the head pivots, pulling actin past it and so the two the two um, filaments actually slide over each other they overlap and when you bend your elbow for example when you flex your elbow those those two filaments overlap more and more and more and more shortening the whole unit there called the sarcomere the sarcomere is a complete unit, and, it, and the sarcomere spans from Z-line to Z-line. And when you extend your elbow, for example, when you extend your elbow, the muscle stretches. How does it stretch? Well, those two fibers, actin and mycin, will then pull away from each other, and the overlap 
between them becomes less and less and less and less. There's less overlap as you extend your elbow, and there is more overlap. The overlap increases as you flex your elbow. Now, if we look at a sarcomere, we have different parts, different areas. We have the H zone. We have, and the H zone is consists of only the thick filament. If you look up at the top there, the very, very top, you have the H zone. And it's just the thick filament. It's not the entire length of the thick filament, but it is part of the thick filament. Do you see that if those two, if those two blue filaments pull apart from each other, the H zone will actually increase. You actually have more because you have less overlap. And that's the and that's the H zone. Now Now we have another we have another um, part of the of the uh, of the of the sarcomere, and that's called the A band. The A band is the entire length of the thick filament. The A band actually never um, never increases in length and never decreases in length because the thick filament itself never increases and never decreases in length. The thin filament, the thick filament, the A-band, none of those actually stretch or, or, or contract. They never shorten or, or lengthen. It's the overlap that increases and decreases. I hope you understand that. If you look at the blue, the blue the blue never lengthens, never it never gets longer or shorter. The red never gets longer, never gets shorter. It's only the overlap that changes, and that's how the muscle gets shorter and gets longer. Well, since the A-band is just the length of the thick filament, the A-band also never gets longer, never gets shorter. It's just the entire length of the thick filament. The I band, however, does change. The I band, as you see, perpendicular to the to the to the fibril, does change. It's only the the the, the blue filament. It's only the thin. Even it's not the entire blue filament. It's just it it it, it starts at the end of the of one thick filament thick filament and ends at the at the beginning of the next thick filament. So the I-band does change in length. Why? Well, because as those thick filaments on one side and the other side, as they move away from each other, more and more blue gets exposed. And as the muscle shortens, those two, the red on, the, on one side and the red on the other side, they become closer and closer and closer together. As they get closer together, the space that's only blue gets less and less and less. So the I band does change. The H zone does change. There's a lot of letters here. How can I remember that the only two bands or zones that change are the H and the I. Well, you can just remember HI. H, I, HI, those are the only two that change. The H band and the I band both decrease when you contract since the overlap between the two filaments increases. Or you can say the H band and the I band both increase when the overlap between the two filaments decreases. When you extend your elbow, for example, when you extend your elbow, 
the overlap decreases and therefore the I band in the H zone uh, increases. That is very confusing. It can be very confusing, especially looking at um, a, a, a still picture and not a video. And that's why in the study guide that I've provided for you, I have a, a, a couple of links for you to, act, to, to see this thing in motion, to see these filaments in motion, um, and to see the muscle contract. And so make sure to refer to go back to the, to the study guide, watch those YouTube videos, it'll help you see exactly what we're talking about. All right, that's the sliding filament theory. <laughs> now that we've zoomed in and zoomed in and zoomed in, there's actually even more. We're gonna actually see now past the cellular level and now at the molecular level and the anatomical level actually. Um, how this stuff works. The only way a muscle contracts is by being innervated, by being connected to a neuron, one nerve cell. It's called a neuron. They control skeletal muscle contractions. You're, you're going to want to fill in like these little blanks here, these all these little parts. We're going to look at the part this at this diagram here this diagram is the connection of a neuron and a muscle cell that connection is called a an nmj neuromuscular junction neuromuscular junction so the end of a the end of a of a neuron where you have the actual attachment uh, is is called the axon, and then where it gets where it kind of looks like a bell there, it gets, it's sort of like a foot. That's called a a, a synaptic terminal or a a synaptic um, a synaptic end. And the space and the space between the synaptic button. And the, and the muscle, there's a little gap in there. That's called a synaptic gap. Or you could say synaptic cleft. <laughs> and so that would be like the, the second box there. That's the synaptic gap, the second box. The first box on the left there, the first box that sort of covering around the whole muscle, uh, that's called the sarco... Um, the sarcolemma, and that's not written here, but it's 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 called the sarcolemma. Oh, actually, I think I did see it. Oh, yeah, it is it is written right here. C a r uh, sorry s a r c o l e m m a. That's that's the uh, what wraps around um, the, the the muscle cell there. Uh, we also have ACH binding membrane receptors. ACH is abbreviated for acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is the uh, is the actual uh, chemical that will be released from the neuron to the muscle on the other side. The other side there, that red right around the the, 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 neuro, the synaptic button is called a motor end plate. Motor end plate. The motor end plate wraps around the synaptic gap. And you see those little vesicles, those little sacs of purple or blue? Those sacs contain the... Um, the chemical acetylcholine, and will be will fuse with the end of the cell and be released into the uh, synaptic gap, and then they attach to the receptors on the on the muscle uh, to acetylcholine receptors on the muscle, 
which are on the motor end plate. So that's, uh, that's the anatomy <clears throat> at the molecular level there of, um, of a synaptic, of a, of a, of a neuromuscular junction. Do you see the, the, the two vertical, um, those two vertical tubes? Those two vertical tubes are called T-tubules, 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 okay? In number six here, that's what it's called, T-tubules, or transverse tubules, transverse tubules, T-tubules. Uh, all right, there's a couple more things. I know this is a lot. I, I, I know that's it's a lot. I hope you've already stopped this video a few times. Do you remember? Do you remember when when you took uh, uh, you know cell anatomy and in, in general biology, um, the the organelles of a typical cell? Do you remember the word um, endoplasmic reticulum, which is a, a like a a pathway for molecules to be processed and made and synthesized and move along the cell. Well, that yellow that you see there, it's been cut off, but that yellow that you see there is actually called endoplasmic reticulum. And the little bag and that long bag that you see running parallel to the T-tubule where it, it looks like things can collect there, the end of the, of the endoplasmic reticulum the end of it is, which is a, a sac, essentially a sac, the end of it is called, what we call terminal cisterny. Terminal cisterny. It's also there in number six. Terminal cisterny. So the terminal cisterny is part of the endoplasmic reticulum. The green that you see there. See where the calcium is, is sort of uh, accumulated, where it's concentrated? That little area there that's right up up against the T-tubule is called the terminal cisterny. And actually, since we're talking about muscle here, instead of saying endoplasmic reticulum, we can call it sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum is is um, is is the term that we use when we when we talk about muscle specifically muscle cells and not just in general when we talk about uh, general muscles uh, like we do when we when we study uh, general biology we study organelles and stuff all right okay All right. So now I believe we have we have enough terminology to uh, to to start the action potential cycle. All this terminology was just trying to get you familiar with the anatomy, so that when we begin to, to, to go through the process of the action potential cycle and beginning the actual contraction cycle and, and, and ending it, uh, we'll be, um, we won't be completely confused. So before, we, before you start now the action potential cycle, um, pause it and pause the video and Make sure that you're familiar with all these, uh, with what we've gone through so far. There's even going to be more terminology and more anatomy. Um, but uh, uh, but what we've done thus far should be good enough uh, to 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 start this thing. All right. So we have an action potential. And this word, we're going to talk about all day long, next unit when we get to the nervous system. 
the, the, fourth, the fourth unit of anatomy and physiology is, is the nervous system. And, and uh, so um, in this unit, in the muscle unit, we're going to talk about the end of the neuron, what happens at the end of the neuron, and how the signal re how the signal crosses from the neuron to the muscle down the length of the muscle into the muscle and then how the muscle contracts but but when but next unit when we get to the nervous system we're going to talk about how the how the signal goes from the brain all the way down to to the end of the neuron. Do you see? So um, we're kind of doing this a little backwards, but it's it shouldn't be too it shouldn't be too confusing in that in that aspect. So when we talk about action potential, that's a that's a nervous term. Um, so we don't really have to understand how, we we don't have to understand what this action potential is, what you do have to know is that it's it's a signal. The, an action potential is a movement uh, of of ions. I mean, you don't even have to know that. It's it's a signal that moves down uh, down the neuron, and it reaches and it reaches the synaptic terminal. It reaches this button, this synaptic button. Okay, this terminal button. And, 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 and actually, I should be more specific. It's action potential number one, the first one. Action potential, potential number one reaches the synaptic terminal. How does it reach the synaptic terminal? That's for next, that's for the nervous system. That's for next unit. You don't have to know how. All, all of the next unit, all of the next chapter, we're going to talk about that. That's the, that's the next exam. That's the whole next exam is talking about how do we go from the brain down to the muscle. We're, for now, we're just going to say, okay, action potential, however it works, action potential number one reaches the synaptic terminal, and then we, we begin with, um, with really what we, what we want to get at. All right. So we have an exocytosis of acetylcholine. <clears throat> What is acetylcholine? It's a it's a neurotransmitter. It's a molecule, it's a chemical, it's a neurotransmitter that gets released from it exits. It's by exocytosis. It exits the neuron and enters this little area called the synaptic gap and and re, and binds to acetylcholine receptors that are that are sitting on the muscle itself on the molar end plate. What is exocytosis? Well, you already know that. When those little sacs, when those little vesicles move and reach uh, the, 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 the plasma membrane, they fuse, they bind and they fuse, and they become part of that membrane. And as they do that, they end up releasing this chemical called acetylcholine in the contents into the synaptic gap. It floods, they flood the, the, the synaptic gap with this chemical and therefore you increase the chance of those chemicals binding to the acetylcholine receptors which are sitting on the, on the muscle, on the motor end plate of the muscle. Once, once the acetylcholine number three, once the acetylcholine binds the acetylcholine receptors on the motor end plate, sodium Na plus sodium rushes into the muscle cell's sarcoplasm. Huh? What? I don't see sodium here. Well, imagine, imagine sodium. I mean, if you got, if you have this thing printed off and uh, in front of you, then with your pen or pencil, you draw a bunch of sodium, which is sitting in the blue area. Sodium sitting in the blue area. Sodium is, we can 
just say sodium is bad for you. Of course, it's not bad for you. It's extremely important, otherwise this wouldn't work. We just say so salt is bad because, you know, we it tastes delicious and we tend to eat too much of it because we need flavor, 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 right? Sugar and sodium and fat, right? Salt and fat, the three, the three white poisons. But without sodium, we would be dead. We wouldn't be able to contract our muscles. We wouldn't, uh, we, our nervous system wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't be able to propagate signal. Um, our hearts wouldn't contract. We wouldn't have anything without, without salt. So it's extremely important. It's just that we tend to consume too much of it. Okay, where does sodium sit? Sodium sits outside of the cell in the blue area there and then rushes in. How does it rush in? Don't worry about it. Again, that's going to be next unit. Just know that it rushes into inside the muscle cell. <coughs> it sits, sodium sits outside and it rushes in. Acetylcholine binds to acetylcholine receptors. They open up channels, sodium channels, allowing sodium to rush in. And by doing this, you get this domino effect. And, and these, these channels open up, open up, open up. And they talk to each other as you run down the length of the muscle fiber. You see those arrows that are going to the right, to the right, pointing to the right? The sig that's how the signal moves down by these sodium channels continuing to open, 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 allowing sodium to rush in. It doesn't make it doesn't make complete sense. It does you don't you don't we're not gonna talk about the physiology until next unit, but just know that that's just what happens. We're not gonna talk about why or how right now. Sodium rushes into the muscle cells sarcoplasm. There's that word it it looks like and uh, uh Cytoplasm. Sarcoplasm is the same thing as cytoplasm. That's the inside of the of the cell. But we say sarco because we're referring to, you know, sarco coming from body, so we're referring to muscle cells. The, the movement, the movement of sodium rushing in and the movement of the signal moving down the length of the muscle fiber is called there's a name for it. It's called action potential number two. It's, it is the signal, it's the second signal that we see. And it sweeps down the sarcolemma. So when we, when we talk about the first signal reaching the end of the, you know, reaching the muscle, reaching the end of the, of the nervous, uh, of the neuron, that's called action potential um, number one. The second signal that moves now down the the length of the the sarcolemma is called action potential number two. So action potential number two sweeps down the sarcolemma, and then it sweep and then it enters into the T tubules. See those T tubules there, those transverse tubules, and and into the terminal cisterne. The terminal cisterne is full of is full of calcium that's waiting to be released out of the the terminal cisterne out of the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, in this process, we we can really like delete number seven. The, number seven is is occurring sort of at the same time. If we go back. If we go back to these acetylcholine receptors, those little, you see those little bananas that are sitting on the motor end plate, those little uh, moons, those acetylcholine receptors. As this, as, as this is occurring, we have to stop, the signal immediately stops. How does it stop? Well, you have acetylcholine esterase, number seven, acetylcholine esterase, uh, in the cleft breaks down acetylcholine and it inactivates it. So it, it, the signal, the signal up in the neuromuscular junction immediately gets um, stopped for that particular signal. 
So as this signal is moving into the T-tubules, technically speaking, the signal doesn't, doesn't just continue over and over and over and over. I mean, for, forever, it's immediately stopped by um, another enzyme called acetylcholine esterase, breaking down that acetylcholine. And if the if the neuron fires again and again and again, well, then you the the, the cycle just continues. But otherwise, other than that, that's sort of number seven is sort of occurring at the same time. So I have I have it in there just so for you to understand that the signal doesn't just continue, but that sort of is going on at the same time. Now, that now if, if we if we want to go from like six to eight. The signal, actual potential number two, sweeps down the sarcolemma into the T-tubules, into the terminal cisternae, and calcium now rushes out of the terminal cisternae and into the sarcoplasm. That's number eight. Calcium rushes out of the sarcoplasm, uh, sorry, out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and into the sarcoplasm. You see that? Now, I have the first step of the, of the contraction cycle. To begin the contra contraction cycle is actually the same thing as the last step of the actual potential, just to make sure that you understand that this is a, a, a continuous thing. Calcium rushes into the sarcoplasm, or you can say calcium arrives within the zone of overlap. What does overlap, what is overlap referring to? It's referring to the actin and myosin. It's referring to the actin that where you have overlap. So, calcium arrives within the zone of overlap. Calcium binds to troponin. Calcium binds to troponin. Do you remember troponin complex? Do you remember those three globs and one of them accepts two calcium ions? Here you go. Calcium binds number number uh, number nine. Calcium binds to troponin. This binding, my friends, this binding acts acts as a signal when the calcium binds it tells troponin to change position when calcium binds to troponin troponin changes position when troponin changes position the trop troponin changing position acts as another signal what is it what is it signal it signals tropomyosin that Twizzler now, the gray Twizzler that you see, it tells tropomyosin to move and roll off of actin's active sites. Or you can say it rolls off of the myosin binding sites. Once tropomyosin rolls and exposes actin's active sites, now Finally, the thick filament, the heads of the thick filament, can now and now have access to the myosin binding sites, like we see here. If we don't have calcium, calcium cannot make tropin, uh, troponin change position, and if troponin does not change position, it cannot tell tropomyosin to roll off. And if tropomyosin does not roll off of the active sites, then the thick filament heads, myosin, can never bind to actin. If, if you can't bind, then you'll never, you'll never be able to slide and slide and slide and slide. I hope you understand that. I hope we got that. Okay. Now we've talked about the action potential cycle and how to begin. What occurs again? What, what, what happens? Let's see here. 
this is, I'm going to be asking lots of questions. This is a lot of questions on the exam, so you, you need to be able to understand exactly what's happening, why is it happening, the order in which it's happening, and what happens if one thing is missing, if one step is missing. What will that do? Action potential, number one, reaches the motor, reaches the terminal button. Acetylcholine is released from the neuron into the synaptic gap. Acetylcholine binds to acetylcholine receptors, allowing sodium, which is sitting on the outside of the, of the muscle cell, to rush in to the, sar to the sarcoplasm. And action potential number two sweeps down the sarcolemma, down into the T tubules, down into the terminal cystine, allowing for calcium that's stored in that sarcoplasmic reticulum, allowing for calcium to rush out and into the zone of overlap. Now calcium finally is able to bind to troponin. Troponin changes position, causing tropomyosin to roll off of myosin binding sites. Finally, the myosin head can bind to actin, to actin's active sites. So far, so good. Now, with the myosin heads already cocked into the 90 degree position, what does that mean? It means that when, when the heads bind to actin, they're in the 90 degree. So do you see that, that top figure there? That's, we're gonna call that 90 degrees. And do you see number two, step two? We're going to call that 45 degrees. So 90 and 45. Okay? So when they bind, they're already cocked, which is which is in which they're already in 90 degrees, which is called cocked. They're ready to go. Cocked like ready to go. They attach to actin's active sites. When they attach, there's, it's a, there's a fancy term called a cross bridge. They form a cross bridge. What is a cross bridge? It's just myosin attaching to actin. The next very, and I know this is like very, very uh, tedious, but we're going we're gonna to even get down to the, mole we're, we're down to the mole molecular level, so we might as well t talk about every step. Inorganic phosphate, do you remember from general biology, we talked about ATP, ATP, ATP. Well, inorganic phosphate, inorganic phosphate, just have a loose phosphate, is released. Inorganic phosphate is released. Where is it? It's in the head. It's in the head. You see that dark purple, the purple there at the top? There's PI, there's inorganic phosphate. What are the steps? First, myosin head binds. Next, inorganic phosphate is leaves, exits the head. Then you have, oops, then you have a power stroke. The power stroke is the head moving from 90 degrees to 45 degrees. The very next step is now ADP is released, adenosine diphosphate, two phosphates. ADP plus P equals ATP. Why is it broken? Well, we're going to see in a second here why it's already broken, but this is where we start. Okay, so when we began this whole story, there wasn't ATP, there was only, ATP was already broken up into ADP and inorganic phosphate. What are the steps again? Well, first, the head binds. I mean, you can go back further and say, oh, calcium enters the zone of overlap and calcium binds to tropin and tropin changes position, causes tropomyosin to roll off of actin's active sites. Now the myosin head already cocked it in the 90 degree position, binds to the active sites, and then, before you before you pull and go into 45, before you have that um, that power stroke, first inorganic phosphate leaves. Then you have the power stroke. Right after the power stroke, you ADP leaves. 
Now, what does that power stroke do? It pulls actin just a little bit, ever so little, towards the midline. Let's go back. Let's take a look at this thing one more time. You see this? You see this picture, remember? We were talking about this diagram. See the heads on the thick filament? When they attach and they do a power stroke, going from 90 to 45, going from 90 to 45, they pull the yellow, which is actin, here in this diagram, they pull actin just a little bit towards the end line, towards the middle, towards the middle of the sarcomere. Here is the actin is blue. The heads, the red heads, pull um, uh, the blue now towards the midline, shortening up the sarcomere just ever so slightly. Here, the heads are blue and and the and the, um, and here's the the opposite. The thick is now blue and the red is 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 uh, actin, and the heads pull the red towards the midline. Okay shortening the sarcomere. Okay, let's start again. Um, I mean, reading reading here. Uh, uh, with the myosin heads already cocked in a 90 degree position, um, at, uh, myosin attaches to actin. Then inorganic phosphate re is released then you have your power stroke going from 90 to 45. Then ADP is released. And then ATP binds to the head. So now we're at number two. ADP leaves. We're already, what were, the, what were those, those three steps? Inorganic phosphate leaves. Then you have a, then you have a power stroke then ADP leaves. Now, going from 2 to 3, ATP, we have another high energy containing molecule. We have ATP. ATP comes in and binds to the head. What does that do? It doesn't give it energy. It just is because it has high energy, it weakens the thick, thin bond. The presence of ATP Listen up. The presence of ATP weakens the bond between the thick filament and the thin filament. In other words, it allows the, the two to detach. We, how did we start? We started detached, didn't we? And then the head attached. Well, well obviously, if we're going to do another power stroke, we have to detach and then reattach and then detach and reattach. Well, how do we release... The head from actin, well, we get another ATP and it binds to the head. And that high-energy um, ATP molecule allows the, the two to detach from each other, uh, weakens the bond, and, and, the, and it detaches. Now, are we back to step one? No. We're almost back to step one, but there's just one problem. The problem is that we're still at 45 degrees. Just like in step two, we were still in the power stroke phase. So we have to pull the angle of the head from 45 back to 90, back to where we started, back to 90. Well, that, my friends, consumes energy. Everything that we talked about so far actually does not use any energy. It does not take energy to pull. It does not take energy to undergo uh, a power stroke. It takes energy to pull that head back from, from 45 to 90. It's called a return stroke. That's why when a, a body dies, it goes into rigor mortis. It's actually, it's actually flexing, not relaxing rigor mortis. Why? Because we ran out of ATP. We can't release, we can't release, um, the muscle stays in rigor. 
so you know it's it's sort of stuck in like two, step two and step three it doesn't take energy to contract it takes energy to release and i hope you understand that <laughs> okay so what do we do we take that atp now that high that high energy currency and we break it apart we hide hydrolyze it we add water i mean you don't have to know that that was that was in general biology but you add a water molecule and you break the the molecule apart and you take the energy from that bond and you put it into um uh, the return stroke going from what to what from 45 to 90 again in step 3 worse we we have we have finally detached from actin however we have one more problem the problem is is that we're still in 45 degrees we're still in the power stroke phase so we have to go from 45 to 90 we have to do this what we call a return stroke in order to do a return stroke now we can finally use up energy we take that energy that atp we break it up into two parts called adp and p inorganic phosphate and this is called hydrolysis and when we break it apart we take the energy from that bond between the p and the adp we take that energy and we put it into moving the the arm back into the 45, uh, sorry, back into 90 degrees. Now, finally, we're back where we started. We're detached and we're at 90 degrees. Okay? Now we're at step 18. The myosin heads, uh, um, myosin head returns, we, we do the return stroke back to 90 degrees. As long as calcium is present, as long as calcium is present, those active sites, active sites will remain um, exposed. And ex as long as they're exposed, the heads will continue. Um, and you can just repeat steps 12 and on, over and over and over and over and over and over. You can repeat this over and over and over as long as calcium is present. If calcium is present, then it can attach to troponin, troponin changes position, and, and then which t tells tropomycin to roll off, and you continue to have the cycle over and over and over and over. Okay? That's a lot. I understand. I understand that's a lot. Okay, now it's time to end the contraction. Once, the, once your brain says to stop, then calcium, then that means that the signal will no longer, you don't have action potential number one, you don't have action potential number two, and therefore calcium won't be being released, it'll go back. So calcium pumps that are sitting there, calcium pumps, pump the calcium back from the sarcoplasm back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum back into the terminal cisternae remember those little bags and if you get rid of the calcium you're putting it back into the bags right you're putting it you're getting it out of the zone of overlap if you're getting it out of the zone of overlap then that means that calcium will no longer be attached to the troponin and if you take uh, those two calciums off of troponin, guess what's going to happen? Troponin then will change back to the original position. And if it changes back to the original position, that tells the sig that that's a signal for tropomycin to what? To roll back back to the original position, to shift back into and covering the active sites. It's in other words, you just go backwards. So again, Calcium will calcium pumps pump calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, getting rid of all the sar out of the calcium. 
it puts it back in its original place. So that means that calcium will no longer be attached to troponin. Troponin changes back to the first position, which causes tropomycin to roll over the active sites back, and it covers those exposed sites. If you, exp if you cover those sites, guess what? Myosin heads can't attach, <coughs> and therefore they can't undergo those power strokes and return strokes. They can't even attach in the first place. And that's how you end and that's how you end the contraction. <laughs> that's a lot. That's a lot of stuff. So that's a lot of steps. I mean we're on tw step 22 here. So that whole deal you 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 got to know inside and out. Um here is here's a, a nice diagram where you see that the T term the T uh, tubules the purple guys and alongside of those you have the terminal cisterni which are part of the the, the the endoplasmic reticulum what do the terminal cisterni have inside of them they have calcium waiting to be released um, and, and if you remember if you remember back in um, the histology unit in unit one when we did histology and we looked at skeletal muscle and when we looked at skeletal muscle one of the characteristics of skeletal muscle was that it had zebra print right it had those striations those black and white those dark and light bands running perpendicular to the length of the muscle fiber well the dark band that was running perpendicular was the combination of the thick and the thin which is the purple that you see here and the light band or the eye band that was just actin that was only the thin filament you see so you have alternating thick and thin thick and thin thick and thin what was the thick well that was the thick filament uh, sorry what was the dark band that was the thick filament and of course some of the some of the, the the thin as well since there's some overlap but the eye band was only the, the thin so you have this light dark light dark light dark light dark and that's how you get that those striations or you know that that zebra print here you can kind of imagine you know i don't know if you squint or whatever you have thick and thin thick and thin thick and thin So that's sort of kind of putting putting them kind of zooming out and, and there you see mitochondria and everything making all that ATP. Well that that um, that is all with the with the action potential cycle and the contraction cycle. Now is sort of a, a we're kind of gonna switch gears now, shift gears and talk about uh, another uh, talk about muscle contraction from another angle. So when we talk about tension, when we talk about strength, when we talk about the the amount of of force you can apply, it's important to know that at the cellular level, at the individual cellular fiber level, those cells are either on or they're off. There, there's no, there's no, um, the, 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 the variable intention, the variance intention is not, um, we don't talk about, it, it doesn't occur because the cells themselves can become really strong or really weak. They're either on or they're off. There, there's only one single tension. But tension overall does vary, does fluctuate by other, by other ways, which is more, which is adding more muscle fibers to the cause. For example, you know, if you're 
picking up a dumbbell, for example, 5 pounds, 10 pounds, 20 pounds, well, you're adding more muscle. You're, you're telling more muscles to join, which is called muscle recruitment. There's another way, which is making those muscles fire faster and faster and faster and faster. Um, that cycle that we just got done talking about, all that stuff can, can occur more often and more often and more often, causing the muscle to seem more powerful, even though technically it's, it's the, the, the single cycle only gives one standard tension. But as you, as you increase the number of stimulations, that overall tension can increase or decrease. Okay, so it's under it's it's important to understand that the muscle fiber is either on or off. Tension varies depending on the number of rests a fiber has. Now, the length of a sarcomere can go from let's just call it let's just call it it can be it can it can go from a length of one to a length of four. Let's just let's just average this thing out, make it easy for ourselves, and just say one to four. So. If our elbow, for example, if our elbow is completely extended, our arm is straight and our elbow is completely extended, those sarcomeres are going to be comp as long as they can get, like four micrometers, okay? And when, as we, as we flex our elbow and bend our elbow all the way as far as we can go, our sarcomeres will shorten, shorten, shorten to a length of one micrometer. Are you following? Therefore, do you see the amount of force that can be applied at a length of one? Fully, our elbow being fully um, contracted or fully flexed? It's, it has zero force. Zero force. The same thing occurs at full length, our arm is not very strong when our elbow, or our elbow is not very strong when we are fully uh, extended or fully contracted, fully flexed. You can attest to this when you try to pick up something really, really heavy. If you pick up something really heavy, what do you, what do you automatically do without even thinking? You bend your elbow at a 90 degree, at 90 degrees, roughly, don't you? Pick up a table? Do you do you keep your arm completely straight? No, that's that's ridiculous. Or do you flex your elbow completely to before picking up? No, you you it's like at a night you put your arm your elbow at like ninety degrees, which ends up making your sarcomere lengths roughly like two or two and a half, something in the middle. And as you see from this graph that also generates the most amount of force possible. So, in other words, as you overlap the actin and, and myosin, as you, over, as you bend your elbow more and more and more as far as it goes, you increase the overlap, you increase the number of cross bridges from the thick to the thin, but that does not equal maximum tension. As you see in the graph, that would be all the way over on the left-hand side, where the sarcomere is very, very short. You have the maximum overlap, <laughs> maximum amount of cross bridges. That does not equal maximum tension. It's somewhere in the middle for some reason. All right. Looking at a single twitch, we have the stimulus. We have a, a latent period, like a... Uh, a period where we don't really see any tension occurring, any force occurring, like a uh, invisible period. Then we have the contraction phase, and we have the relax relaxation phase. This is a typical twitch. We have the stimulus at the neuromuscular junction. Then we have the latent period, which is from the stimulus through the action potentials that we talked about, remember, action potential number one, action potential number two, down the sarcolemma, calcium entering 
all that the muscle tension we actually it's actually zero nothing occurs no, no actual tension occurs why well because calcium first needs to I mean when did we actually see any can any when the head actually started to do the um, go from from 90 to 45 when did we see that well first calcium had to be present and then it binds to tropin and then tropomycin and all that stuff remember well first you have to have all those steps and that's why when you look at this graph you don't see any tension till about you know four or five milliseconds after the stimulus then the graph begins to rise that time between the stimulus and contraction is called latent the latent period the latent phase now finally you have the contraction phase where you have the influx of calcium and you know your cross bridges increase and that can depending on the type of muscle that can let's say for example if if the total time of the latent period is like two milliseconds then for like 15 milliseconds for example like here in the in the uh um, eye muscle is the contraction and then you have um, also uh, tends to be a little bit longer of a relaxation phase uh, and that can be as long as 25 milliseconds and that's when calcium begins to decrease what well, how does that happen well that's when uh, calcium um, calcium pumps pump calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and um, and therefore calcium amount of calcium ions decrease in the zone of overlap and then everything stops again so uh, that it, so what I wanted you to get from the steps of the twitch are those you know three four steps you got the stimulus you got the latent period um, the contraction phase and the relaxation phase so those 22 steps or 24 you know those 22 steps that we talked about can be uh, summarized into these few terms you got the latent the the contraction the relaxation and so on and, and the stimulus at the beginning so this is just another way to look at the to it at the contraction from a from a single um, a single muscle cell um, cycle okay well we also have we also have ten different kinds of tension we have trepe, which is German for staircase, and there's kind of some. It sounds, it sounds cooler if you actually speak, can say it in in German. Trepe, <laughs> trepe, okay. And uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, wave. After that, wave summation. We have. Um, incomplete tetanus and we have complete tetanus so in 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 trepe the biggest thing to notice in in trepe is uh i'm trying to get the the diagram here for you here here in trepe do you see now with with every one of these we're gonna with every one of these graphs we're gonna see these green arrows the green arrows indicates the the time when you have a stimulus. You have a stimulus and another one and another one and another one. Well, in trepe, the stimuli are so far apart that they allow the muscle to relax fully for that red line to go all the way back to zero tension. If those arrows were close enough, the the muscle would not be allowed to rest completely, and therefore, and, and therefore, the those red lines would be higher up. But in trepe, the stimuli are so far apart that the muscle between those uh, stimuli is the tension is able to go all the way back down to zero. Well, in wave summation, the arrows are close enough together that you actually have a significant increase in tension <coughs> if you can if you can if you can cause those stimuli 
to be close enough to each other to to hit and um, in a small amount of time you see the graph beginning to take off to increase going up and up and up and the muscle cannot go all the way back down to zero tension it can't go all the way back down to, to, to complete rest. Now there still is a little bit of rest if you notice because the, the, you do see <coughs> the graph slightly going down then up and then slightly back down so there is a little bit but just not as much as there is in, in trip. <laughs> Alright, now in incomplete tetanus what we see is sort of a plateau effect. That's called incomplete tetanus. And that, and that's basically when you're doing your 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 maximum. For example, at the gym, your muscles are experiencing basically maximum tension, which is incomplete tetanus. They can't go any further. They can't go. They can't contract anymore. But what's strange is that. And there's still a little bit of this this wave going up and down, up and down. Even though we ha we can't, we're not allowed, we're not strong enough to increase attention anymore. There's still a loop. Seems like there's still a little bit of rest, and that's because the muscle actually can do more, but our brains are uh, are 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 giving are are giving this safety mechanism. <laughs> Um, to, to keep our muscles safe. However, every once in a while, there are certain situations where our muscles can actually um, experience complete tetanus. In an emergency, for example, in an emergency, if you're if you see a baby that's um, trapped underneath a car, some kind of emergency our brains can actually override the safety mechanism and allow our muscles to go into complete tetanus. Now you see, you hear on YouTube and you hear these stories of people doing super natural things, you know, flip, flipping cars, you know, over or, you know, something just something that nobody could do on a normal day. That's our muscles going into complete tetanus and reaching really their full potential. Now this, of course, can cause damage to the body later on, and that's why our brains have this safety mechanism. But our but our bodies can actually override this this safety mechanism um, um, in 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 a case of of an emergency. Now at the gym, if you're doing your maximum at the gym, you're probably not going to be not going to be hitting complete tetanus. Um, that's going to be that's that's probably the maximum is uh, that you're going to be able to reach is is incomplete tetanus. Okay, moving moving right along. Um, muscle recruitment. Most motor most motor neurons. Motor meaning. Uh, uh, neurons communicating to uh, a muscle cell away from the brain to the muscle cells. Most motor neurons control hundreds of muscle fibers. A single, in other words, a single nerve cell, a single neuron can control, generally contr controls many multiple muscle fibers, but not the other way around. Never do you see lots of neurons converging and talking to a single muscle cell. Instead, you usually see lots. Uh, we usually see a one single neuron branching and and innervating multiple muscle fibers. What is a motor unit? Well, it's all the fibers controlled by by the, that single motor neuron. What is a motor unit? It's the one neuron plus all the muscle cells that that one neuron is talking to or is is connected to. That's called a motor unit. It's the combination of those those two things. Well, as 
the muscle fibers in a motor unit decreases, the precision increases. If you find in your body a neuron that is that innervates very few muscle cells, you're going to find the precision of that communication very, very high. For example, like in the eye. There is, in a single motor unit, you only have like five muscle cells. Five for every, five, uh, 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 five muscle cells for every um, neuron. That's not, that's not a lot. That, that means that you have to have a lot more, um, that a lot more neurons to make this thing work. As you increase the, the, the as, to, in order to increase precision, you have to have very few fibers per neuron. You see? And that's why your eyes can, are very good at tracking, for example. And even in the fingers, you know, even in the fingers, you're going to have maybe not as many as in the, not maybe not as, as few fibers per neuron in the, in the fingers, but still, you know, a lot, definitely a lot less than what you would find in the leg. In the leg, there is, let's say, for example, 2,000 muscle cells for a single neuron. That means that one single neuron has to communicate to 2,000 leg cells, leg muscle cells, and that definitely decreases the precision because now you, you have more of that gross, gross motor movement. Legs generally don't have to write in cursive, for example, when you put a, a marker between your toe. They're, they're really designed to just you know, push and pull, push and pull, so we can walk. They don't have to draw these extravagant paintings and, and so on. And another thing to know is that, well, these muscle fibers from different units are actually intermingled. So you don't have like little sections and segments. They're all sort of intermingled. That way you get this nice, smooth, coherent, streamlined uh, motion. <laughs> Which is what this, uh, what, which is what this diagram here is is showing. You don't have all the muscle cells from one unit all over in one section, and then all the rest. You know, you don't have all the blues in one section and all the, the purples in one section. No, they're they're intermingled. That way, you get this nice smooth motion as you as you contract the muscle. <laughs> <clears throat> muscle recruitment. As an, an, inc an increase in motor units are activated to increase tension for the increase in demand. When you demand more, what do you do? You increase the number of motor units in order to increase the tension. Again, because the, the muscle cells themselves, the single individual muscle cells, don't have, don't vary, can't vary in tension. They're either on or they're off. But if you tell one motor unit to turn on, and then another one to turn on, and a third and a fourth all together and a fifth, that's how you increase tension for the increase in demand. All right, muscle optimization. <laughs> muscle optimization. Now we're on slide seventy-eight. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna click forward to to this slide right here. We have in in humans we have three types of muscle fibers. In humans, we have three types of muscle fibers, and you're going to find different kinds in, in, in different animals and so on. But in humans, we have type 1 and type 2. And type 2 can actually be divided into type 2A and type 2B. 
Well, the two extremes are the, well, the one on the very left and the one on the very right, type 1 and then type 2b. Those are like the very, very extreme apart from each other, polar ends. And the type 2a muscle fiber type sort of has some characteristics of type 1 and some characteristics of type 2b. The type 1 um, muscle fiber, the type 1 muscle fiber are the, the, the red fibers. They have lots of myoglobin. They have lots of mitochondria. That's, that, 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 those, that myoglobin and mitochondria is what makes um, the muscle fiber actually look dark looks red dark meat and light and, and white meat in, in in chicken for example when you you know dark meat tastes tastes better right or whatever that that dark and light is actually due to that that myoglobin lots of myoglobin and 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 mitochondria that color that you get if I guess I, I, I like to talk in terms of like training or, or like what exercise you like to do. And I usually use the two exercises of like a, a marathon runner versus a sprinter. And when we do this, when we talk in terms of those two exercises, um, it sort of allows us to kind of visualize and put things together. So a type one, a, a person with lots and lots of, of training in marathon running will have very well developed type 1 muscle and type 2a muscle that their their type 2 muscles can can uh, transform from 2a to 2b or 2b to 2a you can never go from 2 to 1 or 1 to 2. You're always going to have the same a number of type 1 and type 2. A person can never convert their muscles completely from type 1 to type 2 or type 2 to type 1. However, within our type 2 muscles, we can convert our, mus our type 2 muscles. We can convert them all to 2B or all to 2a okay so think marathon runner has very well developed type 1 muscle fibers they're oxidative they're slow oxidative they they they're very good at using oxygen what does that mean Mito, uh, um, using mitochondria cellular respiration Um, um, so, um, they're also called slow twitch. They're also called red fibers. These words are inter, are interchangeable. Some people, if, if you say type one, you can also say t red fiber. You can also say oxidative or slow oxidative or slow twitch. Sometimes you hear hear people saying, oh, my, my, my slow twitch fibers or my red fibers. Those are all referring to type 1. They, they, they're, they're long-lasting. Why? Well, because they're undergoing cellular respiration where, you have, where you're producing lots of, of, of ATP. Remember those 32 ATP per glucose molecule. So you have uh, very little uh, fatigue. A number down and number nine, you have uh, these muscles fatigue after hours and hours, like four hours. I mean, depending, of course, on how well you've trained and so on. But also, you also have uh, n number 10. These particular type 1 muscle cells, they also don't get fat. They don't increase in size very much. They have very little, what we call, hypertrophy, meaning that... At, that when you um, when you train those muscle cells, 
how, I mean, how do you train them? You just do the exercise that you're doing. So if you want to train your type one very well, you just go, just go for long runs. It's just very easy. Um, they, they, they're not very large. They don't get very fat. They don't get very wide because they're missing the, a lot of the part that it doesn't make sense. Okay. So, so what makes a, a muscle very, uh, powerful, like be able to, uh, like a very, like, um, contract very with high intensity what you need is a whole bunch of actin and myosin to have that intense immediate power well when you're running a marathon you don't really need uh, you don't need power you just need to, a little bit of power to go for a very very long time so let's throw out all that actin and myosin i mean we don't we don't need obviously we need some of it but we don't need a whole lot, and that's what makes the muscle really fat. That's what makes it hypertrophy, puff. So let's get rid of all that stuff, and let's put in the muscle the stuff that we really need. What do we need? Well, we need a lot of, we need ATP, don't we? So that means we need a lot of mitochondria to make that ATP. So you find a lot more, uh, you know, <clears throat> the muscle only has so much space in it. So you can only have so much stuff. So let's put in more mitochondria and more myoglobin and get rid of the stuff that we don't really, that we're not, we don't really, we aren't really demanding, which is the, a lot of actin and myosin. Actin and myosin is what gives you that immediate power, that immediate, that intent, that intensity, right? The, the ability to uh, have that tension, that high tension. Right, a a a a, a, a long-distance marathon runner will will absolutely kill a, a a sprinter in a long-distance race, but at the same time, if you ask both of those people to sprint, you know, a um, hundred feet, the sprinter will absolutely kill the the, the long distance runner because that per that sprinter doesn't need um, a whole lot of a whole lot of mitochondria they're not they're, they're not gonna need cellular respiration they only need glycolysis with a whole bunch of actin and myosin to give, give give to give that person um, uh, that high intensity short, short run. Both are very well trained people, but on on different types of ex on different types of uh, of sports or whatever. Okay. So that's why way down in number eleven it says low power, low intensity, low power. It can go for a long time, but just that immediate intensity is very it doesn't it doesn't have it doesn't it can't produce high intensity okay um, now on the other hand um, on the other side of the spectrum you have the 2b uh, you can say white fiber um, a fast twitch uh, so so that slow twitch and that fast twitch is just the ability to, to cycle to, to go through one single cycle. So you have slow twitch. Uh, type one is 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 slow because it doesn't need to be fast. It just needs to to work for a very long time. And then your your fast twitch is is to be able to cycle through uh, quicker. And it's also called glycolytic fast glycolytic, meaning you have a whole bunch of glycolytic enzymes and not a whole bunch of um, oxidative enzymes to undergo. Um, oxidative, you know, oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, okay. So, um, and then, uh, and then, the, the with the type two B, these do uh, exhibit major hypertrophy. If you want to look large and ripped and and bulky, um, then you have to work out those muscle fibers. Um, the type 2b um, 
because those ones do have a whole bunch of those myofibrils and the myofilaments. Um, and, and how do you get large? Well, you just need to make more and more of those, those filaments, and that's what, makes, that's what takes up the room in, in those cells. Um, so we're, we'll talk more about like how do you, how do you get ripped? Okay, so there's, there, there you have type 1 and type 2B, and then type 2A is sort of something that is, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle. All right. Um, muscle recruitment, muscle optimization. Okay, so although, so, so stay with me here, although the type 1 to type 2 ratio is genetically determined, is genetically determined. With specific training, we can convert 2A to 2B and vice versa from 2B to 2A. If you demand of your body low intensity workouts for hours, you'll make more 2A muscle fibrils. If you demand short, high intensive workouts, you'll make more of the to B on the on the right side there the right spectrum on the right side of the spectrum uh, muscle fibers. So the questions that we have here are why do some myofibers hypertrophy and others don't? Why do some myofibers hypertrophy and others don't hypertrophy as much? Number two, how do I strengthen my two B fibers? Number three, why are type one fibers activated before type 2 fibers and finally number four if type 1 are full of myoglobin and mitochondria well then what do the type 2 B have and I think number four we've already answered that so if type 1 are full of myoglobin and mitochondria well then type 2 B have are full of uh, uh, myo myofibrils Um, what number one? I think we can we've already answered. Why do some myofibers hypertrophy and others don't? Well, because the 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 ones the ones that do are the two B, and the ones that don't are the ones right the type one. They don't because they don't because what makes a muscle get puffy are those those myofilaments, myofibrils and myofilaments, the actinomycin. Making more and more and more and more and more of those takes up more room and, and then you get that puffiness. Um, okay. As a long distance runner, wouldn't it make more, wouldn't more muscle mass make sense? I mean, if we need to run for a really, 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 really long time, wouldn't having more muscle mass make sense? Well, the answer is no, it wouldn't, because now we weigh more, which is a burden on the, on the body, on the workout. More muscle mass does not necessarily mean you're uh, smart or, or wise to, for a long distance. Muscle cells can only be packed with so much stuff. If I demand long, low-intense workouts, my muscle cells respond by producing more myoglobin, which is ox uh, O2 storing protein, and more mitochondria for slow but steady ATP supply through oxidative phosphorylation, through cellular respiration, and more oxidative enzymes. To optimize the muscle's specific performance, the muscle will take away everything else that's not needed. We don't need every single protein and enzyme and organelle um, be, because that because whatever we maintain it, it costs energy and that's and 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 the muscle is will always try to optimize will always try to only make what it actually is is using um, and, and 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 toss everything out the window. Less muscle mass means less myofibrils and less myofibrils means less explosive power which which jogging doesn't demand so that's perfect we don't demand as when you go for a, long, a marathon you don't need the the immediate explosive power 
which means you don't need so many myofibrils, which means that you can have less muscle mass and you have less weight to carry. And that's ideal for marathon running. So let's take away, so it makes sense to take away as many fast cycloglycolytic enzymes as possible and get rid of it, you know. Now we're optimized for long workouts. Well, how do I get ripped, on the other hand, if I want to be big and bulky, and, and how do I get ripped to muscular? If I demand short, high-intense workouts, my muscle cells respond by decreasing now the useless, I mean, quote-unquote useless, mitochondria, myoglobin, and oxidative enzymes, and increase the stuff that I do want, which is myofibrils, the main contributor to muscle mass. A marathon runner has as many muscle cells as a bodybuilder. They both have the same number of, of muscle cells. Under healthy conditions, people don't gain or lose myofibers or fat cells, for that matter, only the amount of stuff inside changes. We, we are, we're born with the same amount of muscle cells as we die with. We don't gain. When we get stronger, we don't, get, we don't make more muscle cells. When we get weaker, we generally, normally, we don't decrease the amount of muscle cells. They always stay the same, the same number. It's just the stuff inside that changes. We get, we get more stuff or we get less stuff. So adding more of these contractile filaments compounds the power, that immediate explosive strength, and compounds that swelled, ripped, muscular look, especially when we're, when we're contracting. All right. So there's a couple of ways to get ripped. You can develop... The at the neuromuscular junction, you can develop that neuromuscular junction that we talked about by demanding 95% of your repetition maximum, 95% of your 1RM at 1 to 3 reps. So if you go 95% of your maximum, so when you're on the bench press, for example, you go 95%, that's pretty much 100%. And you do one to three reps, what are you developing? Your neuromuscular junction. If you go a little bit less now, a little bit less of your maximum, of your 1M, you go at, at 80%, this stimulates a hypertrophy. And what I know and what do you and, and how many times do I do this? How many reps? You do like five to eight or till fa failure per per set. And then you rest and then you do it again. You see bodybuilders at the gym uh it seems like they're so big and bulky and all they do is they just walk around the gym not doing anything well that's because they're resting they're not doing they're not doing oxidative phosphorylation they're not doing cellular restoration they're doing glycolytic exercises they do very 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 powerful um exercises and then they rest 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 and then they do it again and then they rest, rest, rest. There's, it seems like there's more rest than actual workout. And that's because they, they're they not trying to um, make the body start making a whole bunch of, of mitochondria, demanding oxygen. No, no, no. They, it's the opposite. Why might type 2 never turn on? So type 1 muscle fibers are innervated by a thinner alpha-2 motor neuron. Less surface area, making action potentials always reach type 1 muscles first. So if you, uh, so let me, yeah, let me just keep going through this. Type 2 muscle fibers are innervated by a thicker alpha-1 motor neuron, making action potentials take longer to reach the type 2 muscle cells. Muscle cell recruitment is the body's way of conserving energy by activating one, activating one motor unit 
at a time, with the first activated Moore units being type 1 first, the alpha with the alpha 2 motor neurons. As you add weight to your bench press, you'll recruit even more and more. The last myofibers to finally be recruited are the ones that hypertrophy. So if you wonder, why can I never get ripped? Why do I never get ripped? Well, then it's because you're not demanding enough. The last ones to be activated, the last fibers to be activated, are the type 2, and that's because those take the most energy to maintain. They are full of actin and myosin. It costs a lot of energy, so the muscle automatic, the body automatically says, you know what? I'm not gonna want, I'm not gonna even let those guys work unless I really, really, really need them because they're just full of they, they co it costs too much energy to maintain. So let's activate the type one muscle first, and then if we really need and then if there's more demand, we'll make uh, you know if, if there's enough weight in the exercise, enough tension, enough uh, demand, will will recruit the type 2 muscle fibers second. It's the body's way of conserving energy. Someone that's big and bulky has to eat and eat and eat and eat and eat just to maintain that muscle mass versus a, someone that is uh, very thin, even though both are, are, are perfectly trained. All right, we are... We are... Uh, um, getting, uh, we are approaching the end. Um, there is just a few more things uh, to, 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 to go through. Here is a graph of the four different energy systems. We have the phosphocreatine energy system. We have glycolytic, uh, we have, so we have the ATP stores, phosphocreatine stores, glycolytic, energy and oxidative energy. The, our, eight, our body, when we first, let's say we, we're going to go sprint, our body, or go for a run, our body in two seconds will consume all the ATP, all the immediate ATP in, in our bodies. Five, five pounds of ATP in two seconds. Next, we have this placeholder, this, this, this other system called the phosphocreatine system, and that gives us another 10 seconds. Next, it, next then, then the third system is our glycolytic system. This gives us about uh, a, roughly a minute of energy, and then if we are going for a long jog, a, a jog, going for a long time, we can go up for hours and hours, and our body slowly moves into the oxidative um, system using mitochondria and running through those um, through that system. If you notice, no one system is is in play at one time. There's always some kind of combination. Uh, but you see how you have lots of power, and then it slowly decreases as you go through those systems. The actual amount of power that they give actually decreases, uh, which is exactly in line as what we were saying before. Okay. Um, this is a, a, a fun diagram from general biology. Don't you worry about it. I'm not going to ask you anything about this one or this one or this one, but uh, that, that, that sort of just complements what we were talking about with the other things. But uh, I'm not going to ask you any, anything from, from these uh, three diagrams, this one and this one and this one, or even this one. Uh, this diagram is just showing us, I'm going to try to speed up a little bit here because uh, uh, we're, we're, this is long. Um, this, is, this diagram I just created to show you uh, that, that during work, during work, our body is uh, donating a phosphate from, from, Fossil creatine donating it to the ADP and making ATP. Up at the top there during work, what's the difference between phosphate creatine and creatine? Well, creatine is just a, a phosphate placeholder. When you have that phosphate, it's called phosphocreatine. creatine. During work, we give that 
that fossil, we give the ADP that phosphate, and then so then fossil creatine is converted into creatine through this enzyme called creatine kinase, and making that ATP. Where it is, remember that second system now, once we run out of ATP, now we have ADP, so we can actually have a little bit more that we can give, that little, we have a little bit more ATP that we can make, and that's using that phosphate creatine system. During rest, we go the other direction. Any extra ATP that we make, uh, we can donate that phosphate to um, creatine, making phosphate creatine, that we have all of our ATP stores, we have all of our phosphate creatine stores, and there you have it. Okay. Uh, in in this graph, um, in this graph, we can see uh, that uh, here, you know, we, we set four energy systems here. We've kind of combined ATP and fossil creatine together, and we can see that, um, you know, in the first ten seconds, we're may mostly using fossil ATP, fossil creatine, and and as as we run on, as we jog for way out at to, at 120 minutes. <clears throat> We've depleted all our ATP, fossil creatine stores, our glycoly glycolytic stores, and now we're now we're only doing our um, oxidative phosphorylation, our cellular respiration using mitochondria way out there. It's a it's for these next two graphs, this intensity graph and and this uh, um, um, percent energy versus intensity and our uh, percent fat and, car and carbohydrate versus exercise. Look at the two extremes on the very left and the very right. And on the very, very, very right, at, at zero amount of intensity or, or, or almost zero intensity. Oh, sorry. On the very right, at a hundred percent intensity, we're using zero percent fat and 100% car carbohydrate. Again, if we go to the very, we look at the red line, that's 100% intensity, how much fat are we using? Zero. And how much carbohydrates are we using? 100%. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna have an, if you're, if you're gonna undergo an exercise at 100% intensity, like bodybuilding type intensity, you're not gonna use, you're not gonna consume any kind of fat, you're gonna be consuming only carbs. Whereas if you go low intensity, like for a jog, we're actually using 70%, we're gonna be using 70% of our fat and only 25% or 30% of, of our carbohydrates. So if you wanna burn fats, what do you do? High intensity or low intensity? Well, it makes sense to do low intensity. The same sort of line in this graph, exercise, it's sort, it goes hand in hand. If we, ha if we exercise for only a little bit amount of time, we use like, this, this graph is showing roughly 50-50. However, if we, as we, as we in increase the length of time out to 100 minutes here, we're, we're losing, we're consuming our, our uh, we're decreasing the amount of carbohydrates, but we're increasing the amount of fat that's, where that's being consumed. Okay, also here, the body, here in this graph, we're showing that the body, at, the body prefers to use muscle glycogen and muscle triglycerides, the stuff that's in the muscle already ready to go, and as we deplete those muscle triglycerides and muscle glycogen, we, as those get depleted, well, we still need the energy. Where do we get it from? Well, our last resort. We don't like this, but this is what's left our blood glucose, and our blood, our plasma free fatty acids. Why don't we like this? Well, because the, the glucose in our blood is what keeps the entire body running, our brain, all of the organs in our body. And so this is our last resort. Once we're depleted from muscle energy, well, we have to resort to something, so that, that's, that's what that's showing. Okay, um, we only got about 10 slides left, so here we go. We got isometric contraction and isotonic contraction. Iso meaning the same, and metric meaning the, the, the length. So if I push up against a wall 
and I push and push. If I do really hard pushing or really... All right, we have... Um, <clears throat> let's say we're pushing... Let's say we're pushing up against a wall. If we're pushing a wall and the wall's not moving, our joints aren't moving, our muscle lengths are not moving, that's called isometric contraction. If I push very lightly versus very, very hard, I, the wall is still not moving. If the wall still isn't moving, that means that our, my joints aren't moving and the length of my muscle fibers aren't changing. Equal length of the muscle. That's called isometric. Even if the tension changes, it's an isometric contraction. If I want to do an isotonic contraction, I can change the length. I can move my, for example, a dumbbell, dumbbells. I can change the angle of my elbows going up, doing, muscle, doing curls, for example, dumbbell curls. And as long as I keep the same amount of weight in my hands, that's called an isotonic. Isotonic me, meaning the equal amount of tension. I'm not adding weight to my workout or taking weight away. I put on a five, a five, five pounds on one side, five pounds. I got my bar in my hand, and I'm, gonna, I'm doing curls. I'm contracting and extending, contracting and extending, contracting and extending. Flexing and extending, flexing and extending. And this is called, uh, I'm changing the length of my muscle fibers, but I'm not changing the, 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 the amount of tension. So that, that would be an example of isotonic, not isometric. Can you do both isometric and, and isotonic? Yes. Can you do neither? Yes. You can, you could be changing, you know, you can have any kind of combination. Concentric contraction is when you're going up. For example, if you're if you're if you got dumbbells in your hand, if you got a, a curling bar in your hand, and you bend your elbow all the way up, bend, 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 and you can flex, flex, flex the elbow. That's called a concentric contraction. And if you slowly bring your arms back down, extend, 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 that's called an eccentric contraction. That's the difference between those two. All right. Uh, how do muscles change in size and strength? Well, you can, uh, muscle cells respond to overload by hypertrophy. If you do more than what you did the day before, the cells will, will hypertrophy. You, all you do is have to increase. And, um, and cells, muscle cells will atrophy or decrease in size when overload is taken away. If you are, you know, you're doing a lot of work and you every day you do less and less and less and less and less, well, your muscles will shrink, 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 shrink. Up to two days following the physical activity, muscle uh, increases the rate of protein synthesis. That's why they say when they train, you do upper body one day, lower body, upper body, lower body, upper body, lower body, right? Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for example, upper body, and then Tuesday and Thursday, lower. Because up to two days, up to 48 hours after the muscle cells still increasing the rate of protein synthesis, but uh, anything more than that, then the cells begin to break down again. Okay. Um, all right. We are almost done. The most important thing from the, 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 these last few, last few slides, here's the Cori cycle. The Cori cycle is just showing that the lactate that our body produces doesn't just go to waste. Actually, the liver can pick it back up, and with the with six ATP, we can actually make glucose again, and and the cycle starts over. How much how much energy can we get out of one glucose molecule? Well, we can get thirty two ATP, but if we if we end up uh, producing lactic acid, it doesn't just go to waste. We the body can actually pick it up and and, and make energy make use a little bit of energy, but then make a lot more if we need. Um, uh, you can read about the, uh, the lactate threshold here. Um, uh, <clears throat> you know, what's the difference between, you know, how come sometimes, how, how come some days I, I go home 
um, so the, the the burn, the immediate burn that you that that you experience when you're running up a pair uh, up up some stairs, that is due to uh, lactic acid in the body. The, the the soreness the next day is actually not because of lactic acid. Uh, that's because of the breakdown of muscle. Uh, so I want you to to know this delayed onset muscle soreness, uh, and this occurs. Um, uh, this, if, if you're sore between 24 hours and 72 hours, this is called delayed onset, and this is actually not good for the body. Delayed onset is different than acute muscle soreness. If you're sore the, the next day and only the next day, this is, <clears throat> this, is not, this is not necessarily bad for the body. But if you find yourself sore after... For, an, for 48 hours or even more than that, three days or four days after, this is the, the, the muscle cells will die, are dying and are being replaced by, um, by scar tissue. <clears throat> useless useless, uh, useless um, tissue, basically, non-contractile non tissue. But if you're, if you're sore only like the next day, like you work out at night in your store the next day, but but then it goes away within that day. That's acute muscle soreness, and that's actually that's just fine. That's not um, necessarily muscle damage. Uh, here is a nice graph. Uh, we're, we're not going to get into it, but uh, if you can kind of figure it out, that's great. We are now done with the entire muscle um, chapter. That's all you got to know. That is an incredible amount of information. That's um, going to take, uh, you know, a week or two to get through. So get started and um, make sure to do this little section at a time, little section at a time, little set. Don't get overwhelmed and try to know everything all at the same time. Um, and as you move on to set from section to section, make sure to go back and review so that way you don't forget the stuff that you learned from the, from the day before. Always go back and review and then continue. Then go back and review those two, and, and then continue. Then go back and review those three, and then continue. All right. Good luck, everyone, and thank you.